Hello, my name is Lee Presser. This is my show. I speak frequently to very interesting people. Some of these conversations are so exciting, so intellectually stimulating, I thought others might like to listen in. This is the reason we started recording Conversation with Lee Presser. Welcome to Conversation with Lee Presser. Congressman Jerry Costello decided to retire after 22 years in Congress. Mr. Costello, a Democrat, has been a Southern Illinois congressman since 1988 when he won a special election to replace the late Melvin Price. According to the left-leaning Daily Cost online blog, Mr. Costello was more, quote, blue dog than not, unquote. The blog indicated that the seat might be filled by a conservative. Well, our guest, Jason Plummer of O'Fallon, Illinois, hopes to be that conservative. Mr. Plummer, the 2010 Republican nominee for Illinois Lieutenant Governor, has entered a primary field of three other Republican candidates. He is a former chairman of the Madison County Republican Party. Currently, he serves as vice president of corporate development for RP Lumber Company, a family-owned and operated business. And he's also a United States Naval Reserve Intelligence Officer. His unit is stationed at Scott Air Force Base. Today we, we will be discussing his ideas and his reasons for seeking the nomination as the 12th Illinois District Congressman. Jason Plummer, welcome to Conversation. Thanks, Lee. I appreciate it. Nice to Good meet to be you. Here. Yeah. Um, so let's just cut to the chase. Why should you be filling the shoes of Jerry Costello? Well, I, I think there's a few things that's going on in the 12th Congressional District that uh, I've been passionate about and been focused on for a long time. I think that uh, we really need to focus on the job situation in this district. I think if you look at the industries and the businesses that have been a long time uh, economic driver in this region, the energy industry, the agricultural industry, manufacturing, transportation, a lot of these industries have been devastated by poor public policy. And I think I bring uh, an idea and a vision for the type of public policy we need to bring those industries back to this area so they can thrive and employ more people in quality, stable jobs. What sort of policies do you object to that currently are in place that, and what would you replace it with? Well, there's a lot of policies, I think. I, I think one of the biggest things we're seeing right now that covers all of the industries, I don't care if you're, you're a farmer out, out in the field, if you're a manufacturer in a factory, or, or if you're a, a, a coal miner trying to find a, a coal mine that's still operating in the area. One thing we see from this current administration in Washington, D.C., is an EPA and a regulatory environment that's completely out of control. And we need to put the reins on government so that the, they're not a burden to, in, to, to business and they're not a roadblock to success. And, and that's what we're seeing right now. So we need to lessen a lot of the regulatory burdens we have on our businesses and on our workers. I think we need to look at the workers' compensation system. I think we need to look at the tax environment. I think we need to look at federal spending as a whole because you know federal spending and the, the, the deficits that we run, the debt that we carry, the interest we pay on that debt, that has a negative impact on our economy. And I think when you look at all of these things as a whole, it's clear that business and workers in Illinois and nationwide are carrying too many burdens. This month, mm -hmm. the United States government is going to spend approximately between 100 and $150 billion more than it's taking in. Last month it did that, the month before, the month before, the month before, next month, month after that, month right. after that, month after that. In other words, we're now spending somewhere between one, uh, one trillion, two hundred billion, and one trillion, eight hundred billion dollars more each year than we're taking in. Right. This is a real problem because it costs interest to carry that kind of debt. Do you have any specific proposals as to what it is that needs to be cut so that we're not spending a hundred to hundred and fifty billion more? each month than we're taking in. Well, I, I think you're exactly right. The numbers are out of control. I think a lot of folks are aware of the numbers and a lot of folks aren't. I mean, I think one thing I bring to this campaign is the fact that I'm the only businessman in this race. I understand what you have to do to balance a spreadsheet. I understand what you have to do bringing revenue in and expenses out. I know what it's like to have to make a payroll. I, I, I like to tell people all the time, I know what it's like to sign the front end of a check, not just endorse the back. I think we need more people who are fiscal conservatives who understand 
balance sheets and income statements and understand the, the financial disaster that's awaiting for us in Washington, D.C. and go to D.C. to actually address those issues. Now, you ask specifically, how do you do that? Because it's a huge issue. You know, a lot of people want to say, well, we're going to cut spending. Well, how are you going to cut spending? I think that there's two things right off the top we have to do. We have to look at the entitlement system. And the entitlement system in this, in this country is something that a lot of people depend on. They've depended on it for a long time. And unfortunately, our politicians in Washington, D.C. have completely lost track of why those programs are there and who are they there for. They're not preserving that money for folks when they retire. They're spending that money as soon as it comes in the door. And then when we have folks retiring, the money isn't there. So we have to look at entitlement, uh, at our entitlement program, and we have to bring logical, common sense solutions to the problems that, that exist within those programs. The other thing we have to do is, is driving revenue to Washington, D.C., because you don't just cut your way out of this. You have to enhance revenue to Washington, D.C. And I don't care who you are, if you're a Republican or if you're a Democrat, if you're liberal or you're conservative, history is history. And history shows that when you lower taxes on businesses, when you lower taxes on hardworking people, you actually increase revenue to Washington, D.C. And right now, all I hear out of Washington from a lot of folks is, you know, let's increase spending and let's increase taxes. And they hope that increasing taxes on these, these certain groups of people is just going to bring more revenue. But we all know that when you tax job creators, when you tax people like that, you're actually going to lessen the revenue that goes to Washington, D.C. And Washington, D.C. right now needs as much money as it can possibly get. We need to take the reins off of our economy. We need to take the reins off of our job creators and allow our economy to grow. When our economy grows, more people are employed, more businesses are being started, more businesses are expanding, we'll drive more revenue to Washington, D.C. Now, your area, the 12th, um, you talked about energy, but you're really specifically referring to coal, aren't you? I mean, in the in the main, it, your absolutely. area in, your, in the main, your area used to be a very very large right. coal producing area. Right. And I say used to be, uh, and I don't know the numbers anymore, but uh, percentage wise, over the last 30 years, I mean, how much coal is being produced in your area now compared to? back in, say, the 70s. Well, for example, 20 years ago, the 12th Congressional District had 37 operating coal mines. Mm -hmm. Today we have nine. And I assure you, Southern Illinois hasn't run out of coal. You know, we've got plenty of coal, we've got a lot of opportunity, but unfortunately, poor public policy has driven uh, the coal companies, have driven uh, out of the state. They're in other areas now. They've taken all of those wonderful coal mining jobs uh, and, and quite frankly, folks can't find those jobs anymore. We have a huge opportunity to really tap the natural resources that we've been blessed with and Washington, D.C. is not allowing us to do that. I go to Washington, D.C., I'm going to fight for the coal miners, I'm going to fight for the coal companies. I want us to access as much coal as we can because it's right underneath our feet. And that would be such a boon to so many uh, small towns throughout the 12th Congressional District. Folks can't even realize it. How do you balance that, this is a hypothetical, sure. how do you balance that, which you just said, against those who have seen what smoke from smokestacks does to a community. Uh, and just so that you know, I'm old enough to remember, I was in a place called Steubenville, Ohio, uh -huh. and this was like many, many years ago. This is before the Clean Air Act even, which would be 1970. And in Steubenville, they actually, that was a, a, it was a big, big uh, industrial center, and on every roof there was this much soot, right? right? that came out of the chimneys of industrial plants. Now, right. of course, everybody was happy to have a great job. They were making good money. They were living good lives, but they were living in a very sooty, dirty environment, which, of course, led to the foreshortening of some lives. How do you answer that, those who argue that if you start opening coal back up, that you're increasing those problems? Well, because it's simply not the case. I mean, there's plenty of studies out there that show. I mean. Comparing uh, even an operating coal facility 20 years ago to one that would exist today, it's apples and oranges. I mean, the technologies we have in terms of clean coal opportunities, in terms of uh, environmental controls and, and a lot of that stuff that we have today that would be involved in these facilities, they didn't exist 20 years ago. They definitely didn't exist uh, 40 or 50 years ago. So we have an opportunity to tap these resources without negatively impacting the environment. And the opportunity, as I said before, it's right beneath our feet. 
there's a lot of folks that would gladly want these jobs. I mean, you get into some of these towns, you go to Pinckneyville, Illinois, you go to Benton, Illinois, you go to West Frankfort, you get down into Steelville and some of these areas. I mean, these are economically devastated areas, and they're economically devastated because this is a weird situation where government, through regulation and poor public policy, has taken jobs away from people. You know, th these coal mines didn't want to shut down. Uh, n nobody wanted to leave this area. Government's taken the opportunity away from its citizens to be productive, to put food on the table, to have a job. These people want to work. Yes. We just have to give them the opportunity to work, and accessing the coal that we've been blessed with is a huge way to do so. Well, there are some people who are just so involved in their way of thinking sure. that they, they simply cannot see a way clear to allowing not just coal, right. but petrochemicals right. in general to be burnt where the, uh, <clears throat> you know, these gases, these particulate matters go into the atmosphere right. and onto the ground. Now, in the process of doing that, I mean, I have to personally say that they have accomplished what you've said is that they have shut down whole industries. Right. And not just shut down industries, but they've destroyed communities and they've destroyed families. And that's the real tragic sense of it. You know, a lot of the environmental left, I, I, you know, I don't know if they're out in Seattle, Washington, or if they're out in Washington, D.C., they've never been to Benton, Illinois. They've never been to Steelville, Illinois. They've never been to these areas. I've been to these areas a lot. We operate businesses in these areas. And what they've done to these communities is horrible. And quite frankly, a lot of the elected officials that have allowed this to go on under their watch they should be ashamed of themselves. You know, and I bring the perspective to this campaign that I'm going to fight to open every coal mine I can open, and I want every job that we can possibly find to come to the 12th Congressional District. And what they're doing with the coal mines is no different than what they're doing with the Keystone XL pipeline that's been in the news a lot lately. I mean, the President of the United States knows that this Keystone XL pipeline has had absolutely more environmental studies, more environmental research. They've been looking into this thing for four years. They know it's the safest, most logical path that they could create for this pipeline. It's going to create over 20,000 immediate jobs. They think over 100,000 jobs over the course of time in related uh, economic activity. And he's shutting it down to appease the radical left. He's turning his back on places like the 12th Congressional District. The Keystone, X, Keystone goes into the ConocoPhillips refinery. They just had a huge, I think nearly $2 billion expansion of that refinery. You know, a lot of jobs at stake, a lot of good things can come from this, and we're shutting it down to appease the far left. And I'm going to stand up to the far left, and I'm going to say I want every Keystone XL job, I want every coal mine job, I want every job I can possibly find that's a good job to come to the 12th Congressional District because I'm the candidate for jobs. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what our campaign's about. Um, you mentioned Keystone, and um, of course, since the uh, presidential decision not to give them a pr I don't think people really understand what the president has to do with this. Sure. The United, because that pipeline was crossing the American-Canadian border, right. that's what brought the federal government into it, and so the, exe the federal executive has to approve this, and if they don't approve it, then it can't cross the, the border. As a result, there is this threat from the Canadian owners that they're simply going to, instead of making a north-south, they're going to go east-west, or actually west, right. and they're going to sell all this oil to our friends, the Chinese. I say all that because now I want to ask, because I understand that the Chinese are buying up a lot of coal as well. Is southern Illinois coal also being sent, barged uh, down the river and then into the Gulf and eventually over to, uh, to China. Well, a couple things there. First, you're exactly right. It was actually the State Department that, that nixed the Keystone XL pipeline, but it was President Obama's State Department that did so at his direction. The State Department had previously actually okayed the Keystone XL right. more than one time. This was strictly, it wasn't a policy decision, it was a political decision. It was a, a political calculation, and unfortunately, thousands of people are going to be without jobs because of a political calculation in Washington, D.C. And that's the kind of stuff that Americans are frustrated with. This shouldn't be political stuff. This is common sense. Not only will it bring jobs, but it will lessen our dependency on foreign resources. And, as you said before, if we don't use this, uh, this natural resource, it's going to be used somewhere else. And the Chinese are going to use it. You're exactly right. The Chinese use a lot of natural resources. And when the Chinese are burning coal, and when the Chinese are using oil, and when the Chinese are accessing these resources that we're turning our backs on, I assure you they're doing it in a far less environmentally friendly way 
then we're burning our coal in. And, and, and that's something that I think a lot of folks uh, fail to realize and a lot of folks in Washington, D.C. like to ignore. Mm -hmm. Mentioning the Chinese, of course, I, I euphemistically said our friends, right. because the Chinese, while they work with us now, rather than being openly hostile, uh, they're really not our friends, they are our competitors. And um, at some point, the Chinese would like to reunite with their, uh, uh, their brethren over on the island of Formosa, sure. Taiwan. And there are times when, uh, as an intelligence officer, you may have heard that you know, the Chinese have certain ships and they have certain equipment which they are developing in order to be in position someday to seize that. Of course, the American 7th Fleet is available, but it's greatly diminished in power from what it used to be. As a naval officer and then as a congressman, what would your position be on the size of the United States Navy and the United States military in general? Well, there, there's a lot, of, a lot of foreign policy in that question, and that's something I'm very passionate about. Uh, you're exactly right. Uh, the Chinese are competitors, uh, and the Chinese do not always have our best interest in mind. I, I, I do believe that firmly. And that's one of the scary things about this current administration, uh, President Obama and his Democrat allies in the House and Senate. The, the budget that we're looking at, cutting a half a trillion dollars out of the budget, is it going to come out of the areas in the federal government where we know that there's a lot of waste, fraud, and abuse? No, it's not. It's going to come directly out of the Pentagon. And what we're looking at, if the president and his Democrat allies, if, if their plans go forward, we'll have the smallest standing army we've ever fielded since World War II. We'll have the smallest navy we've ever fielded since World War I. We'll have the smallest strike fighter force we've ever had simply because they can't come to a, a, a logical, common sense solution in Washington, D.C. We're truly putting uh, our folks in uniform in harm, and we're putting our nation in harm because a bunch of politicians in Washington, D.C. can't sit down and come to a common sense solution. And I think I'm going to take some of these common sense solutions to Washington, D.C., and I'm going to fight for these things because I think the last thing we need to be doing is, is, is cutting the budget of uh, uh, our armed forces in ways that puts our soldiers in peril. And that's something that, that I'm very passionate about. China is rising right now. Their armed forces are growing substantially. They're getting ready to, to release one of their first carrier they've ever fielded. A lot of stuff is happening over there. And while China is growing, and while we're having these issues with Iran, and while a lot of other governments who aren't necessarily friendly to us continue to, to grow their armed forces, we're looking at shrinking ours, and not shrinking it in a common sense way, but drastically shrinking it, mothballing ships, mothballing planes, uh, losing uh, over 100,000 soldiers practically overnight. And that's something I don't think we can afford as a nation. When I was a naval officer riding ships back in the 80s, we were headed for a 600 ship Navy. Right. And I was shocked. I mean, I was absolutely shocked because I hadn't followed it. And probably most of you out there in the audience haven't been following this, that our Navy is now well below 300 ships. And when you're talking about mothballing ships, you're talking about going from this 280-something ships down. And folks, that's ridiculous. Uh, you, you have no idea of what it takes to protect American interests here at home and around the world. A lot goes on that never makes the newspapers. There's no doubt about that. And like I said, you know, having the smallest standing army since World War II, the smallest navy since World War I, and the smallest uh, strike fighter force ever, the Democrats in the Congress, the Democrats in the Senate, and this president thinks that's a good idea. And I think that that's devastating to this country, absolutely devastating. And it's something that I fear, and it's something that I want to fight for. And back here in the 12th Congressional District, we have a lot at stake. I mean, Scott Air Force Base plays a huge role in our national defense. It also plays a huge role in the local economy. And I, I am absolutely determined, as the congressman from the 12th Congressional District, to not only defend Scott Air Force Base, but to grow Scott Air Force Base. That's something that I'm very passionate about. And that's something, I'm a Republican. Jerry Costello is a Democrat. 
Jerry Costello did a good job uh, in, in protecting and growing Scott Air Force Base. Was it two or three rounds in uh, which? At least three. <laughs> they, they tr were, right. you know, and Scott was sort of on the list, but right. then he managed to get them off the list. Absolutely, and, and, and Congressman Costello, uh, he's a passionate defender of Scott Air Force Base. Congressman Shimkus right next door, who's endorsed my candidacy, is a passionate defender of Scott Air Force Base. Mark Kirk, the U.S. Senator, he's a passionate defender of Scott Air Force Base. He's endorsed my candidacy, and I think it's important to send someone to Washington, D.C. that understands not only the important role Scott Air Force Base plays in our national security, but also in the local economy. And when we hold this seat in the 12th Congressional District, when Jason Plummer's the congressman, I'm going to work hand in hand with Mark Kirk and John Shemkus to make sure that Scott Air Force Base continues to play a huge role in the economy and national defense. Yeah, uh, many people don't know that Scott is the place from which all military transportation assets are directed. Right. I mean, Any time that a plane travels from anywhere to anywhere, a military plane, it's Scott Air Force Base. Ships carrying cargo, it's Scott Air Force Base. United States Transportation Command there. Absolutely, and, and it's, a, it's taken on more command since then, and, and that's a huge national defense role that it plays, but also a lot of people don't realize Scott Air Force Base has a $3 billion a, um, annual impact on the local economy each year. Mm -hmm. $3 billion a year Scott Air Force Base drives into the local economy. That's from dealing with suppliers, that's from payroll, that's from housing, and everything you can imagine. I mean, that is a huge impact on the local economy. Economy. And as devastated as the 12th Congressional District has been, could you imagine what it would be if Scott Air Force Base wasn't here? It would be well, I, yes, it, it would be three billion dollars short. It, it would be a huge impact, and, and that's why I think we need folks to understand the important role Scott Air Force Base plays in both national defense and the economy. Mm -hmm. So, all right, you mentioned way back there near the beginning of this talk about uh, EPA right. and other executive uh, departments. Uh, which come under the heading of the the president. Right. What is it that, as a congressperson, that you think that you could accomplish, even in the majority? Sure. What is it that you think that you can accomplish, vis-a-vis um, -vis the uh, the EPA, the Department of Education, the Department of Energy? These are sure. Republican uh, Republican target uh, departments. That's sure. why I mentioned them. Well, I, I think a lot of folks. Um, underestimate the impact that a really determined person can have. And I mean, I've seen firsthand uh, the way Congressman Chimkus, for example, has fought for our farmers uh, against EPA regulations. Uh, they want to regulate the farm dust that a combine kicks up as a farmer's plow in his field. Absolutely absurd stuff. And when stuff like that comes What do they mean by that, that they want to regulate dust? How, how do they, you regulate dust? You'd have to ask the EPA because they want to regulate the amount of dust that farmers essentially produce while they're working their fields. Uh, too much dust and they want to penalize the farmers. Absolutely ridiculous stuff. I mean, the average voter out there would go, what in the world? I mean, uh, you want to punish farmers for kicking up dust? I mean, what do they think they're going to do? How are they going to plow their field? But that's just one. For every farm dust situation, I assure you, there's hundreds of others out there that a congressman can grab a hold of, focus on, and quite frankly, drive the EPA back to where they should be. And you know, I was having a conversation with uh, some folks on my campaign the other day, and they're talking about the levy issue that we've run into here, Madison mm -hmm. County, St. Clair County, Monroe County, that area how important that is for, and how big of an impact that, that issue can have. And they were having meetings in Washington, D.C. on it, and finally Senator Kirk, Congressman Costello, Congressman Shimkus were involved. Finally, Senator Kirk asked uh, uh, just another bureaucrat out of, I, I believe it was Connecticut or Delaware, who would somehow figure out a way to get her office involved in this local issue. Finally, on the conference call, Senator Kirk said, why are you even involved in this call? What value add do you bring to solving this problem? And the answer? Silence. And that, that's the problem we have. We've got a lot of these bureaucracies, a lot of these areas that have grown out of control. And you have a lot of people who are just trying to justify their existence. You know, I think one reason why the farm dust thing is you've got bureaucrats that don't have anything to do. They don't do anything productive for the economy to a large degree. So they have to justify their existence. And unfortunately, by justifying their existence, they're usually throwing a burden in front of uh, someone out there who's trying to start a business, some worker out there that's trying to put food on the table for his family, some, um, you know, some college graduate that has a great idea for a startup company. They're throwing roadblocks in, in front of these people. And, and we need to get them off the backs of the entrepreneurial spirit of America. You know, many of these bureaucrats make at a minimum 80,000, some of them 150, 160,000 a year. 
doing whatever, you know, being paid for out of taxes. We got about just a little under five minutes sure. less. If there's anything that we haven't discussed yet, I would like you to bring it out on the table now. Well, no, I, I think we've touched on jobs a little bit. I mean, I think federal spending and the job situation in this area is something I'm passionate about. And I tell people all the time, you know, if you look at the 12th Congressional District in Illinois, if you look at our access to natural resources, if you look at our large, uh, well-educated, well-trained workforce, if you look at some of the uh, institutions of higher education that we have, if you look at our access to transportation networks, road, rail, river, air, we are a phenomenally blessed part of this country. I think we're, I think we're the breadbasket of this country, but unfortunately, poor public policy has devastated this area. I don't think there's a person, Republican or Democrat, in the 12th Congressional District that will say this area is thriving. This area is not thriving. This area is struggling. We've been struggling longer than the rest of Everyone will say, well, we're in a national recession. We are, but we've been struggling longer than the national recession. We've been bleeding jobs. We've been bleeding good families. We've been bleeding good businesses. We need to bring those things back to this area. Your family's business sells lumber right. and, other, and other construction materials, right? right? So I would think that you would get the first hint of recovery. Right. Are you getting that hint of recovery? We're not. We're not. You know, I, I hear a lot of politicians out in Washington, D.C. throw out this statistic or this piece of data and so on and so forth. Fact of the matter, what we're seeing on the ground is we're seeing an American population that wants to work but struggling because they can't find jobs. If they do have a job, their wages have been cut back, their hours have been cut back, they're not working as much as they'd like to work. We see uh, college graduates and high school graduates that can't find decent jobs. Um, we see uh, pockets of, of, of excitement, we see pockets of, of optimism, but unfortunately, I believe until we get a pro-business, pro-worker, uh, elected officials in Washington, D.C., when we remove this administration and we get someone in there that's going to take government off the backs of its citizens, I think that's when we'll see a lot of excitement. You know, we need to get rid of Obamacare, we need to cut government spending, and we need to le let the American people do what they do best. And when we do that, that's when we'll see this economy turn around. And we got to find a way to pay off $15 trillion in debt. Yeah. One of the two things that I would like to see you carry sure. when you're talking to groups in the 12th district is that 100 to 150 billion dollars a month. I don't know where, you know, they talk about, well, let's raise taxes. I mean, you could liquidate Bill Gates and Warren Buffett, and what do you do the next month? You, you know, just, just that fast. But what folks don't seem to understand is that as this 150 billion a month gets added in, so too does the interest. Right. Last year, last fiscal year, 2011, we were paying just a shade under nine billion dollars each week in interest, in interest on the debt right and that's right. at incredibly low interest rates just imagine if it were to go up only three points absolutely what that nine billion a week would turn into uh people around your district what do you think they might do with an extra nine billion dollars uh, 30 seconds no a absolutely and people always talk about well what's business doing until we resolve these big picture issues that you just talked about, a $15 trillion debt, $15 trillion plus dollar debt, you're not gonna see businesses jump in here because this administration and its Democrat allies have really uh, scared a lot of folks and they put them on the sidelines because there's so much uncertainty out there. We need politicians and we need elected officials who aren't gonna try to figure out how to make this a career but be leaders. And I think I offer that. I think we're gonna go to Washington, D.C. We're gonna offer some common sense solutions on how to solve some of these big picture your items and when we're done doing that I look forward to coming back to this area and working in our family business continuing my service in the Navy because I love business I love the Navy but we've got a lot of problems out there we need to solve thank you very much for your time here today I appreciate it. and thanks for your service oh, appreciate it. thank you and uh, to my audience I've been uh, speaking with uh, Jason Plummer he is a uh, United States Congress candidate in the 12th district and we'll see you we're out of time we'll see you next week thanks bye